So this is a laboratory milestone, one that has been sought after for decades, Brian. And from an environmental perspective, fusion has always had a strong appeal because it's uh, it's not dangerous. It's uh, it's different than fission, which is your normal nuclear power. Fusion uh, combines atoms rather than splits them, right? It puts them together. Uh, you can <laughs> watch YouTube videos like I did to get a, a brush up on what fusion is. Uh, but it's very interesting, and it's just hard to do, and they haven't achieved a net energy gain. So it takes a lot of energy to create um, particles, atoms, that want to fuse together. It, it's hotter than the inside air of the sun, the sun air of the sun. Yeah, well, I watched a YouTube channel, uh, the Cleo Abram YouTube channel, Huge If True is sort of the name of the series, and a couple of YouTubers, did you watch that? A couple of YouTubers built a, a fusion reactor in a garage. <laughs> Did they? Yeah, okay. and it it worked, but the key is they did not get more energy out than they put in. So, and this has been the the problem with fusion for all these years. It takes a huge amount of energy, and they're not getting even that amount of energy yeah, out of it until now. Billions of dollars from governments around the world have been put into this, and this is the first time that it's happened. I guess they got out one point five times the energy that they put in using the world's most powerful laser to do this. Uh, there's always a nagging caveat, however, with this, and in, in that all of its efforts by scientists to control the unruly power of fusion, their experiments consume more energy than what was going in. But that changed, Brian, according to the New York Times, at 1.03 a.m. on December 5th, when 192 giant lasers at the laboratory's National Ignition Facility blasted a small cylinder about the size of a pencil eraser, that contained a frozen nubin of hydrogen. Do you have any frozen nubins of hydrogen laying around the house? Probably not. Let me check the freezer. It, oh, encased in diamonds, so that makes it even more rare. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds totally practical. Totally practical. Well, that's that's what they did, and that's kind of, yeah, it's a long story, but the, that's what they did. They used all these lasers to get to that, and in a brief moment, lasting less than 100 trillionths of a second, 205, no, pardon me, 2.05 megajoules of energy, roughly the equivalent of a pound of TNT, nothing to sneeze at, bombarded the hydrogen pellet out of flowed from that pellet, a flood of neutron particles, the product of fusion. See, when you put things, when you put particles together, they create energy. When you take them apart, they create energy, uh, which carried about three megajoules of energy, a factor of 1.5. Yeah, and this is basically, this is how the sun works. The sun is like fusion energy is as near as I understand it. That's correct. And, and obviously the sun is producing endless amounts of uh, energy for free. It's doing a hell of a job. So the solar panels on our roof are technically fusion. <laughs> yeah, technically. <laughs> wind is technically solar uh, because you need uh, the sun to create wind because it's the energy differences that create wind. So some people okay. like to call wind power solar power. And uh, now we can call it fusion. I don't know if you want to. So does Tuesday's announcement mean we'll have cheap fusion energy soon? A lot of people, such as my um, uppity son, would say yes. They assume, oh, it's a breakthrough. They'll start manufacturing tomorrow. A couple of years from now, we'll see uh, solar panels go into the landfill. Yeah. Well, it's taken them, what, 50 years to get <laughs> yeah. this far? Well, the answer is No according to the New York Times, okay? So even if scientists figure out how to generate bigger bursts of fusion, immense engineering hurdles would remain. Uh, experiments have studied one burst at a time, basically. So a practical fusion power plant using this concept would require a machine gun pace of laser bursts with new hydrogen targets sliding into place for each burst. That's the challenge. They're using magnets and, and magnetism to float things and have a continuous repeating chain. There's three different ways of uh, or, or approaches to uh, fusion power. And this is basically an experiment at a nuclear weapons facility. But there's a Canadian um, team working on something too, and they're going to have a prototype uh, power plant um, getting built in the UK. But it still doesn't mean that it's anywhere near decades away. So the torrents of neutrons flying outward from the fusion reactions would have to be converted into electricity. That's another challenge. Basically, the fact that they created more energy doesn't make a power plant, okay? So the no. laser complex uh, fills a building with a footprint equal to three football fields. 
So it's too big, too expensive, and too inefficient for a commercial power plant, at least right now. A manufacturing process to mass produce the, the precise hydrogen targets would have to be developed. And that sounds to me nowhere near. Okay, let's put it in the context, Brian, because remember, we have to decarbonize the planet by 50% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. And China, yeah. if you're listening, 2060 is not good enough. Uh, and we can do it. In fact, we have 80% of the technology available to to 100% by 2030, I've read. Yeah. If we wanted to. Um, yeah. But we, we choose you know, not the to. The problem is... It's just, you know, things like uh, heat pumps, you know, like there's going to be a waiting list for my heat pump. We need to just, you know, crank up production of the existing technologies, wind, solar batteries, and heat pumps. Um, we just got to make enough of them, and that's all we need. We're, you know, my son doesn't think that the world is coming together and will reach those targets. I hope they do. I think they'll miss them. But uh, at the same time, I think people underestimate the economics of clean energy in yeah. from 2030 to 2050 like it's going to just you know mm -hmm. erase at least as far as power generation goes this is from power magazine they're on top of this too uh tony relstone a nuclear engineer at cambridge university in the uk told uh, national public radio in the united states that unless more significant progress is made fusion would be unlikely to have a major role in power generation for another 40 to 50 years yeah that's too late it's too late it's um too late for me too <laughs> uh, my kids might see it at the, when they're my age or older. Uh, my grandkids might live in a world where uh, you uh, a solar farm erected today would come down mm -hmm. and be decommissioned in thirty years, and even then, it's not it doesn't sound like it's it, it's going to be there. Okay, it could be, but it doesn't sound like it would be. Well, there's, this is something we've talked about before too, but there's so many super complicated energy systems that exist today, including things like nuclear, like making a nuclear plant. It's just insanely complicated. Building an offshore floating oil platform to drill for oil, like it's insanely complicated. And if solar, wind, and batteries has existed, existed 50 years ago, we wouldn't have done any of these things. <laughs> like, they're just too complicated and expensive when these cheaper alternatives exist. And that's kind of the problem, is that solar and wind and batteries and, and geothermal and other things that exist and are getting cheaper uh, make it less profitable for, you know, these, for investment yeah, in, in the stuff like this, because yeah. there's going to be huge upfront costs to get the development there. And then you're going to have to really back the technology in order to get the prices down. So David Keith, mm -hmm. uh, climate expert uh, says fusion, maybe, but beware of the hype. Um, I don't know the details he says, but for what it's worth, my, f my first professional job was in Canada's national lab, working big lasers for fusion. And I have been interested since. Uh, getting more energy out than went in into the laser is cool technical benchmark, but it has almost nothing to do with the practical requirements to make commercial power. That's what people don't realize. And yeah, you, you hear this, this, uh, this, this silver bullet thing. I'm going to finish what he had to say, but they're just not looking at the whole picture and maybe they're not hearing that one sentence, that caveat at the end of the interview which is really important. Suppose one had a free supply of fusion reactions in pellets. You could make competitive electricity, he asks, hard. Getting cheap energy from uh, neutrons is really hard. Even those neutrons, if they're free, it's really hard. And worse when it needs a high vacuum. So there's lots of just technical details that, that yeah. are hurdles, really. Yeah, well, this these YouTubers that made a... Uh... Uh, a fusion reactor in their garage um yeah like a vacuum is one of the big things for it you got to suck all the air out and they you know blew a breaker on their wall and then they lost all the air and then they had to suck all the air out again uh it's still kind of cool that they made it and they sort of made it with these off-the-shelf parts um it you know it's a lot of fun but uh yeah it's just insanely complicated it's it, it is a, a genuine breakthrough like they got more energy out and people have been trying to do this for literally 50 years or more so it's a huge breakthrough but nowhere near practical but it's a slow churn towards commercialization which is what we think of 
right? So, um, you know, another challenge is that it is as hot as the sun. So you have, you know, that stuff breaks <laughs> down when you have something that mm -hmm. has to contain something that hot and a vacuum in particular. So there's, there's serious challenges here that I'm confident they'll work out. And I think that, you know, uh, next century, there will be no wind turbines or maybe even solar panels that will just have fusion at the end of this century sometime. Maybe 60 years from now when it's cheap and cheap enough to spread, 70 years, I don't know. Um, I think it is the future. It's just going to take a long, it sounds like it's going to take a long road to get there. So uh, Bloomberg says this, they have a uh, opinion columnist that says, well, okay, what challenges remain? It's a st it's still a long way from the breakthrough in California to building a fusion-based power plant. It's still a long way from the breakthrough in California to build to building a fusion-based power plant. Well, this experiment generated excess uh, energy on a small scale. The industry needs to develop systems that can produce much more excess energy on a much larger scale. Uh, this is 1.5, Brian. I heard 10x as kind of where they need to be. A net energy gain shows that the concept will work, but the systems are still complicated and expensive. This test used some of the most powerful lasers ever built, and they aren't readily available for commercial power plants. The industry still needs to do a lot of work to make the technology widely available and affordable. And uh, that was just from Bloomberg. Okay, this is the opinion piece from Bloomberg from David Fickling. You can have the uh, energy gain by 50% because uh, you lose most of your heat or half your heat in the system, such as the cooling, you know, the just the, the water and the pipes and everything get, get lost. So the New York Times uh, says this. This is uh, just hot off the press. This is after the announcement, which happened a little while ago on uh, Tuesday morning. It says it will take quite a while before fusion becomes available on a widespread practical scale. If ever, probably decades, said Kimberly S. Boodle, the director of the Lawrence Livermore uh, facility where this announcement took place. The director herself is saying probably decades. So I'm not being a poo-poo here. I, uh, I'm not being a, <laughs> a nuclear naysayer. Uh, this is from the horse's mouth, literally. Now, other people in the industry will say, well, we've moved along fast and it's going to be better than that. But, you know, it's certainly going to be decades. You know, we, we might have something functioning next decade in some level, but it's not yeah. going to be commercially functioning uh, that you can replicate and spread. Okay, this is what she said at the news conference. So not six, de say, not six decades, I don't think, which is what most people used to say. Uh, I think not even five decades, which is what we used to say most often. Uh, so that sounds like 40 years. I think it's moving into the foreground and probably with concerted effort and investment, a few, could, a few decades of research on the underlying technologies could put us in a position to build a power plant. Yeah, this is not around the corner. I'm sorry. I mean, I wish it was, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Most cli climate scientists and policymakers say that to achieve that goal of limiting warming to 2 degrees Celsius, or even the more ambitious target of 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming by 2050, the world must reach net zero emissions by then. And this, Brian, under any circumstance, doesn't seem like it's going to be any significant part of that, even under the most ambitious, optimistic scenario.